On June 23rd, 1969, the front page caption of the New York Times screamed out this headline, Judy Garland, 47, found dead. Judy Garland, whose success on stage and screen were overshadowed by the pathos of her personal life, had taken her own life. The papers related that her life often seemed to be a fruitless, endless search for the happiness that was promised in Somewhere Over the Rainbow, the song she made famous in The Wizard of Oz. She'd been married five times. Her life was described as miserable offstage because of the effects of drugs prescribed either to stimulate or to tranquilize her. Judy Garland's career was marked by a compulsive desire to please other people. Why, in her very first performance at the age of two and a half years of age, 30 months old, in the Grand Theater in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, she sang Jingle Bells at a Christmas program. So compelling was her response to the footlights and to the crowd gathered for that occasion that her own father was forced to remove her from the stage after she had repeated that song, not twice or three times, but seven times. According to one newspaper account, and I quote, the other side of the compulsively vibrant, exhausting performances that were her stage hallmark was a seemingly unquenchable need for her audience to respond with acclaim and affection. And often they did, screaming, We love you, Judy! We love you! Maybe you're familiar with people like Judy Garland. People who are often driven by a desire to please other people. You may be among them. In fact, if we're brutally honest with ourselves, I think we all hunger for the approval of other people to different degrees. We all have this yearning to be accepted by others, which, if not checked, will make us crowd pleasers. Now this morning we're continuing our series of Sunday morning messages on the theme, The Well, based on the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, and indirectly on Mark Hall's book entitled The Well. And this morning we're focusing on the whole of approval, the whole of approval. Now, the whole of approval is so subtle and so self-deceiving that sometimes I think we're not even aware that we're in that hole. But we all get there simply because we all hunger for the approval of others. I hunger for it. I like it. And so do you. I want to clarify up front that pleasing others is not all wrong. Understand that. Pleasing others is not all wrong. God created you and me as social beings. The Bible constantly uh, refers to the honor that will come to you by living a life that's in harmony with Jesus Christ and also with your fellow human beings. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, but we're also to love our neighbors, our fellow human beings, as we love ourselves. This implies a relationship in which we do that which pleases others. There's no premium on cantankerous living. And yet, this God-given social instinct can become a compulsion that separates us from our primary relationship of faith in Jesus Christ. When we allow ourselves to be driven by this instinct, there's nothing but trouble ahead. And to me, there's no more tragic figure than the person who's trying to walk the course of always trying to please people. Look to contemporary life, for examples. Look to secular history. Look to the pages of the Bible. In all three places, you'll see many biographies of men and women compulsively driven to be approved by others. Pontius Pilate happened to be one of these. This isn't the time of year we normally talk about Pontius Pilate, but it's so appropriate for this particular theme. I'm sure you're familiar with that fateful evening when Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot into the hands of the Jewish leaders. You'll remember how he was dragged before the high priest, Caiaphas. The next morning, these same religious leaders placed Jesus before Pilate, the procurator of Judea, the official representative of Rome. They made accusations against Jesus, endeavoring to turn the Roman ruler's mind against Jesus. 
Pilate was very shrewd in his observation of human personality. Pilate noticed what these men were up to. He spotted their jealousy, their envy that was driving them in their attempt to have Jesus crucified. In verse 10 of Mark chapter 15, it says, Knowing that it was out of envy, there's the word, it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. Always the clever politician, Pilate found a way to have the innocent Jesus released. He had it figured out. So you know how he selected a convicted murderer by the name of Barabbas and offered either his release from prison or the release of Jesus. He hedged his bet that it would be Jesus that they would want to have released, but he underestimated that crowd. Uh, he underestimated their fury. He underestimated their desire to have Jesus crucified. Drawing back in surprise, Pilate released Barabbas. And then he asked the crowd, what shall I do then with this one that you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him, the crowd cried out. Pilate asked him, why? What crime has he committed? But they simply amped up the volume and shrieked again, crucify him. Now, Pilate's in a jam. In his heart, he saw Jesus as innocent. At the same time, he wanted to please his Roman superiors, including the emperor in Rome. He also wanted to be sensitive to the legitimate followers of Jesus, who seemed to be reasonably benign and non-incendiary. He also wanted to be fair to his own conscience, conscience. And he also wanted to at least acknowledge his wife's uh, warning that's recorded in Matthew's Gospel, where she had said, don't have anything to do with that innocent man because I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Ah, but now we see the basic weakness in Pilate's personality. Matthew tells us when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And then comes the historical record of Mark, who writes in verse 15 of Mark 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd... Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Here was a crowd pleaser. Here was a man who wanted to desperately defend his own position. He wanted power. He wanted prestige. He wanted popularity. Pilate's motivation shows up in the words, wanting to satisfy the crowd. Or as it puts it in a more contemporary translation, desiring to please the crowd. Let me ask you, are you a crowd pleaser? Is pleasing others the most important thing in your life? Do you find yourself in situations in which you know what is the right thing to do or say, but you tend not to do it because of what others might say, because of peer pressure? A friend of mine with a drinking problem once looked me in the eyes and said, I really don't want to drink. But you know, I can't run the risk of losing my friends and not getting invited to the parties that I want to go to. A businessman who was shaky in his ethics once told me, I just have to go along with the way of, uh, this way of doing business. It's expected of me. He said, I can't survive doing it the Christian way. Seems a lot of politicians work hard every day trying to satisfy and please their constituencies, even when it means flip-flopping on particular issues. But the fact is that most people that I know at least don't really respect a person whose modus operandi is that of crowd pleasing. Why is that? Well, for one thing, if you're trying to please everybody, you're going to be somebody that you weren't meant to be. God created you and me to be single-minded persons, not double-minded. A double-minded person, one who loves Jesus but also lives for the approval of others, is unstable in all his or her ways, according to James. A single-minded single person's life is marked by stability, by integrity, by faithfulness to Jesus Christ. A second reason there's no future in being a crowd pleaser is that you can't please everybody all the time. And if you've tried that, you know how futile that is because... This approach is subject to a law of diminishing returns. The applause of others is fickle. It's fleeting. Popularity declines. 
And the person whose life is built on this will find himself or herself in serious trouble. Just ask Tiger Woods, who was at the top of the golf world just a few short years ago, arguably the best golfer to ever play the game. But when his personal problems burst onto the world stage, not only did his golf game suffer, but the applause stopped. And until very recently, when he's won a couple of tournaments, people were bombarding him with the question, what's wrong with your game, Tiger? Some former pro athletes whom I know personally made the mistake of assuming that the cheering would never stop. They didn't save their money, they didn't plan ahead, and when their playing careers were over, they found themselves addicted to the applause of others to, to the extent that they really didn't know how to function. On the other hand, the Jesus follower who sees popular acceptance as an occasional fringe benefit is secure within himself or herself because he's not dependent upon human praise. How dependent upon are you upon the praise and the adulation of others? Ultimately, friends, we live for the applause and the praise of just one. One person. So that in the good times, in the bad times, and in all of the in-between times, we rest in knowing that God is with us, even if we're serving Him all alone. Another reason in being a, uh, that a, being a crowd pleaser makes no sense at all is that you pay a very big price when you try to please everybody. Nothing you do will have a cutting edge to it. Your service for Jesus will be blunted. It will be dulled by your efforts to make everybody happy. The pastor who tries to please everybody in the congregation cannot be a prophet. He or she cannot bring the Word of God in power because the Word of God offends sinners and self-made people. God calls His children to be faithful and true to His Word. Now understand that faithfulness to biblical teaching won't win you a popularity contest. No, it won't. Pontius Pilate wanted to be popular with everybody. And even though personally he couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus, he buckled under pressure trying to protect his position, and so he went down in history as a man of weak principle. Now, if you and I are to avoid falling into the same hole of approval that these men fell into, we've somehow got to get some handles on this tendency to be crowd pleasers. Because if we don't, it will strip us of spiritual power. Somebody has rightly said, trying to make everybody happy makes nobody happy. So let me mention in closing five what I would call straightforward spiritual action steps that you and I can take when pleasing others becomes most important in our lives. All right? Number one, give yourself, and by the way, there's a little outline in the bulletin if you want to fill that in, in, in the blanks there. Number one, give yourself a new 100% to Jesus Christ. That's a way of saying, put him first in your life and focus on his opinion of you because his opinion and his say is the only one that really matters at the end of the day and at the end of life. I like what Mark Hall says in this chapter on the whole of approval. He says, what's true about you is what God says about you. That's what's true about you. So make him the one you want to please. Let everybody else take a position in line behind that. Ask yourself is my first and my primary allegiance to Jesus. All right? Second, expose yourself to the discipline of His will for you. That's another way of saying grow in your knowledge of Him as you read your Bible and in prayer. That's where about 95% of God's will for your life and mine will be discovered. Again, Mark Hall in this chapter on the, in his book on the well says, when I walk with Jesus... Spend time in prayer, fellowship with other believers, and listen to his nudges. The favor of others doesn't drive me or derail me. Jesus completes me. When I walk into work, I don't need my boss to stroke me about how great a job I'm doing because Jesus has completed me and told me the truth about myself. I can just bloom where I'm planted. End quote. If you've been exposing yourself to the disciplines of Bible study and prayer, you know that you're on the right track. Number three, hold on to the truth in love. Hear those two words, the truth in love. Dr. James Edwards, 
a man who has climbed major mountain ranges around the world, writes about what he calls the narrow ridge in, ma in mountain climbing. He makes a point how that there are ascents going up the, up the mountain that are quite wide, walking through meadows at the base of a mountain that are not all that dangerous. He said even a normal mountain face or a rock wall allows the climber to veer to the right or veer to the left in search of the very best line of ascent. But he says a ridge defines your line of ascent. And the margin of deviation from the line of ascent is only as wide as the ridge itself. He describes the ridge of one major mountain that he and his son climbed together as about 15 feet wide in the lower portions, wide enough where they could eat and sleep. But then as they climbed, the ridge began to narrow and steepen. He says there are places where, where it's nearly vertical and only a few feet wide. And then he said that at isolated places, the ridge that they came to was barely wider than a climber's boot. So that in effect, a climber could look down thousands of feet one direction, thousands of feet another, and know that a misstep either way would be the last step he would ever take. The early church developed guidelines regarding tolerance and narrowness. Latitude on non-essentials, but razor sharpness on matters of essence. In other words, there, there are matters about which Christians may differ without jeopardizing the faith and the fellowship. The early church called these the adiophora. They're like broad mountain faces. You could roam here, you could roam there in search of the very, the very best line of ascent. But there's another word they use for things that really count. The word is diaphoranta which means those matters about which Christians cannot differ and still be faithful to the gospel. Like Jesus, this ridge makes narrowness into a virtue. For example, the relationship between faith and works is a ridge. We're saved by faith, but the faith that saves results in good works. A crucial ridge in our faith is recorded in Ephesians 4, verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Neither truth alone nor love alone is the gospel. The truth without love can be inhumane. Love without truth dissolves into permissiveness and sentimentality. Our goal, you see, is to live and speak truth and love. Truth in love. A fourth action step you can take when pleasing others becomes most important is to stick to your convictions. Now, this takes a lot of courage. Why? Because you face a lot of trouble. You face trouble from those who are non-believers in Jesus, as well as sometimes trouble from those who are believers. What to you may be a God-given conviction may to them appear to be a compromise. And what to you may be a compromise may to them be a God-given conviction. I've seen people who wanted something so badly in life that they compromise their convictions and live to regret it. They compromised and got the marriage partner that they thought they wanted. They compromised and got the financial gain that made them step over ethical lines. They compromised and they got the job advancement, which happened to betray a friend in the process. Not easy to stick to your convictions, but when you put your head on your pillow at night, you'll feel a lot more inner peace. Now, when pleasing others becomes most important to you, remember, number five, that your reward and your applause is not of this world. As those who follow Jesus, you and I are called to be in the world, but not of the world. Our real identity is as citizens in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We're here to carry out his direction and his orders. And we look forward to the time when we spend eternity with him in heaven forever. Our reward, the applause we will get, will take place. But it'll take place in heaven at the point that Jesus Christ looks at us and says, well done, good and faithful servant. And I'm guessing that he'll have, he'll have a big uh, cheering section of saints to back him up. Some of us live to be 50 years old, 60, 70, some uh, well into their 90s and even beyond today. During that time, we may receive a certain amount of applause. But the applause dies out. The big question for us is, 
Did we remember our Creator and consider pleasing Him most important? If not, we'll just be like that two-and-a-half-year-old Judy Garland in the Grand Theater in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, so addicted to the crowd's adulation and approval that we just keep singing jingle bells time after time after time after time until finally somebody has to yank us off the stage. As for me, as much as I like applause, I would much prefer to pass on that in exchange for Jesus' commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Amen.